Well, good morning again, church. Thank you for joining us. As we come into this Mother's Day, I thought, and, and God sort of led, that we would take a look at Esther. And, and some of you sort of go, well, I get, you know, biblical woman, but, you know, what do we look at with Esther? Well, Esther was one that took on the role of mother to a people group. Right? And, and when we think about Esther, we've got to do a little bit of history first, right? And, and so we sort of step back, and, and for the history nerds in here, kind of like myself, we want to date the book of Esther. Like, where are we at in history at the time? Well, if you start at the beginning of the book of Esther, you realize that at the time, the, the Jews or the people are in Persia. And at the time, there was a king by the name of Xerxes. Well, now we can transition to, where are my movie fans in the room? And so when you hear Persia and you hear Xerxes, what instantly pops into your head? The movie 300, right? Which is historically not accurate per se, right? Like Gerard Butler was not that, you know, rib fighting in the hot gates, whatever. But that's a natural place you can go visit in Persia. There actually was that defense, or not in Persia, in Greece, I'm sorry. You can go find that place in Greece where the Spartans, 300 Spartans stood, slowed down the Persian army, which eventually led to the battles that pushed Persia back over a land bridge that Xerxes had built. He had built a land bridge partly. They ran the, the Persians back over it, and then in typical Greek fashion, they burned that sucker down, right? That's where the book of Esther picks up. So when you watch the movie 300, after you see the end of that movie, when the, the Greeks are getting ready to beat the Persians and run them off, as soon as Xerxes gets back to Persia, Esther begins. And so we can date where we're at in history based on that, not only from biblical evidence, but from extra biblical evidence outside where we saw these battles happen. And so that's where we're picking up. Xerxes has just come back to Persia. He's got his tail kicked a little bit. And so you can imagine what state of mind he's in, right? If you're a conquering king who at the time declared yourself a god, and then you go into this place where this ragtag group of Greeks banded together and ran the largest known army at the time back to Persia with their tail between their legs. Which, fun fact, there is one line in that movie of 300 that is recorded in history as being said by the Spartans. Does anyone know what it is? Well, there's two lines. First off, most of you that are hardcore Second Amendment folks, you put it on your truck. Right? Molin Labe. When the Persians showed up, one of the first things they would tell your army to do, which is lay down your arms. Lay down your arms, don't resist, and you'll be taken care of. The Spartan reply was that. Molin lape. Which means what? Come and get them. Right? You want them? Come take them. Right? That's one line that is actually recorded in history as spoken by the Spartans. The Persians recorded that. They wanted that recorded because they thought they were just going to decimate and wipe out the Greeks and the Spartans. So they wanted that recorded as to say, don't back talk us Persians because we'll wipe you out. Backfired a little bit, right? There's one other line that is actually recorded by the Persians in history that made it into the movie. And that is, Persia was sort of known that if they would take you over, they would take your most elite fighting group and they would roll it into their army because what better way to sort of get you under control than to put your people fighting among our people, right? So they were known for taking archers. And if I say that line, you should probably realize which one it is right now from the movie. And they would fold archery into their group because at the time in hand-to-hand -hand combat, having a great archery side of your, of your battle was helpful because you could sort of fight from distance. And so when Persia showed up to fight the Greeks, to fight the Spartans at Thermopylae, they said, you have no archers. You have no way to withstand the might of our archery. We will just rain down upon you. In fact, the line is directly quoted. Our arrows will blot out the sun. And the Spartan reply was recorded not only in history as it is in the movie. What did the Spartans reply with? We will fight in the shade. Right? And so those two things are actually recorded in history. And you just imagine being the Spartan in that moment that would be there enough to sort of pop back with that, right? Yeah, there it is. You're just like, woo, let's go, right? Let's go. Everybody's ready to go fight. And so those two things are recorded. That's what's happened to Xerxes, right? He ran into this ragtag group of people that he underestimated. They beat the world's largest, most powerful standing army. In fact, at this point, when Persia showed up in a place, more often than not, countries would just capitulate. They would just lay down and Xerxes would walk in and they would take over. He declared himself a god. Well, the Greeks decided to punch God in the mouth. 
And this typical lower G God was not real. So he got punched in the mouth and sent back packing. The book of Esther picks up here. And so you imagine his state of mind, right? He's hurt. He's scared. He's frustrated. He's looking for a win, right? If we're honest with any of us, you're looking for a win in this situation. You need something to get back in the win column, right? Uh, you think about this in the terms of sports. There's a reason, right? And of course, we make fun of it. As college football rolls around, right? We're getting closer and closer to the beginning of college football. Some of you roll your eyes at that. Some of you are counting the hours and minutes until the day it starts, right? But you think about the beginnings of college football, the first couple of weeks are sort of throwaway weeks, right? Usually the teams in the top 25 do what? They're going to pay somebody large sums of money to come in and do what? Get wrecked, right? Like Alabama's going to pay some Division II school a million dollars to come in and lose by a hundred, right? That's what's going to happen, right? That's, that's what they're going to do. Why? Because you want a win, right? You want to have that win. You want to start on that moment. And if you're the other school, you're perfectly fine with losing by 100. You may not be on the team fine with that, but the school is fine with sending you to take that, that L to collect a check. Every once in a while, though, it doesn't work. Point, case in point, Appalachian State versus Michigan in the early 2000s. Michigan, the University of Michigan paid Appalachian State a million dollars to come to the big house in Michigan and take an L. And if you go back and watch that game, how does it end? Appalachian State, I believe, blocks a field goal and wins the game. So they take a million dollars from the school and a W. So every once in a while, it backfires. But if you're Xerxes at this point, you're looking for a W. And it doesn't always look like what you expect it to look like. Enter Esther. Right? Because the Jews at this point are still in Persia. They're still there. They're still dealing with part of the captivity. And Xerxes, in looking for a win, begins to listen to a man named Haman. Which, for those of you in, that may bake or you may study things in Jewish culture, if you ever go to a Jewish Passover meal, the people, uh, most serious Jews will still eat what are called Haman cookies. And in the middle of those Haman cookies will be red jelly, either strawberry or cherry to, to, to sort of be like his blood. Uh, because he's a villain, right? If you're wondering there, he's a villain in this story. Haman comes to Xerxes and says, hey, I know you need a win. We've got this people group here, the Jews, that are sort of not like us. They don't look like us. They don't act like us. They don't worship like us. So let's take a win and just persecute them. Let's just take their stuff, let's take their rights and just start killing them. And Xerxes looks around and he sees a people group who are underutilized. They don't look like him, they don't act like him, they don't worship like him. And he says, yes, that's what we will do. And so he puts out a decree starting at the end of chapter 3. He says this at verse 13 in chapter 3. Letters were sent by couriers to each of the royal provinces telling the officials to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jewish people, young and old, women and children, and plunder their possessions on a single day, the 13th day of Adar, the 12th month. So they pick a day that they're going to do this, and they begin to send it out and saying, hey, on this day, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do this to the Jewish people. Xerxes is looking for a win like this, but what he doesn't see coming is Esther, right? He doesn't see this young Jewish woman, and he doesn't see Mordecai. As we start at verse, chapter 4, verse 1, says, When Mordecai learned all that had occurred, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, went into the middle of the city, and cried loudly and bitterly. He went only as far as the king's gate, since the law prohibited anyone wearing sackcloth from entering the king's gate. And there was great mourning among the Jewish people in every province where the king commanded and an edict came. They fasted, wept, and lamented, and many lay on sackcloth and ashes. The Jewish people here realizing, what could they do? They couldn't stand up to the might of what was left of the Persian army, right? If Xerxes wanted to do this, what were you going to do, right? You might resist for a minute. You might give it a good couple of weeks, maybe a month, but eventually you're going to get rolled over. This is going to happen. 
right? You can't stand up in front and fight against this, right? It'd be like us as a ragtag group of people today. If we stood up and said, hey, we're going to fight against the United States. And what are we going to do? Hold out for about an hour until we get overrun by tanks and planes? That's what's going to happen, right? We can't stand up to that kind of power. Four, Esther's female servants and her eunuchs came and reported the news to her, and the queen was overcome with fear. Uh, at this point, we realize Esther is not only a Jewish woman, she is queen to Xerxes. And she's hidden her Jewish culture from him to this point. He doesn't know that she's a Jew, but she knows that it will come out, and she's scared. She sent clothes for Mordecai to wear so he could take off his sackcloth, but he did not accept them. Notice here, Esther was only there because Mordecai had encouraged her to go be a part of the king's court. Mordecai had encouraged her, go and do this. Go be a spokesman for our people. Esther summons Hakluth, this is verse 5, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to her and dispatched him to Mordecai to learn what he was doing and why. So Hakluth went out to Mordecai in the city square in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened as well as the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay the royal treasury for the slaughter of the Jews. Notice here Haman working both sides of the aisle. He's trying to get Xerxes a win, but he's also trying to line his own pockets in the middle of it. Right? If you were worried that Haman may not be a villain, you're starting to get a feeling that he is, right? What's the villain always interested in? Money. Money and power. Verse 8, Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa, ordering their destruction so that Hatleth might show it to Esther, explain it to her, and instruct her to approach the king, implore his favor, and plead with him personally for her people. Notice here what Mordecai is asking Esther to do. Go to the king and ask him to change his mind. Go to the king and tell him to change a royal decree that he has put out. How else could we say this? He's asking her to do what? To risk her life. Put yourself sort of in that moment. Why, if you're the king and your wife comes to you and says, hey, we really need to rethink this plan. I don't think you're right. You're the king of, at the time, one of the largest empires on the planet. Are you much in the business of listening to anyone? Probably not. And anyone that would come and question what you have decreed is playing with fire. So what's Mordecai really telling Esther here? Take your life in your hands and go ask him to relent. He's asking her to be mother to a people group she didn't give birth to. Right? Go and speak on our behalf. Go and do this thing even though we can't pay you for it, right? Go do this even though you don't know all of these people. But go and try to save them. Verse 10 picks up. Esther spoke to Hatleth and commanded him to tell Mordecai all the royal officials and, and the people of the royal provinces know that one law applies to every man or woman who approaches the king in the inner courtyard and who has not been summoned. The death penalty. So Esther, you're saying, I can't even approach him if I'm not summoned or death is the answer. Only if the king extends the golden scepter will that person live. I have not been summoned to appear before the king for the last 30 days. That was Esther's response reported to Mordecai. Mordecai tells the messenger to reply to Esther, don't think that you will escape the fate of all the Jews because you are in the king's palace. If you keep silent at this time, liberation and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place. But you and your father's house will be destroyed. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Right? One of the most famous parts of scripture taken from the book of Esther, right? For such a time as this. Right? Mordecai telling Esther, perhaps God has placed you here just for this purpose. In the same way that sometimes moms come into your life 
for a purpose. Whether that's the mom that gave birth to you or the woman who just loves you enough to not let you be the same as you are, right? I know every woman in here could probably talk about people that they've mommed, right? Yes, I'm using it as a verb, right? That you mom people. Why? Because you love them. Right? Not you like them. Not like love. You love them. And you want what's best for them. And it may be for a lifetime. And it may be just temporarily. But to someone, somewhere, you have been a mother. You have been that person that would sacrifice your life for that other. 15. Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and assemble all the Jews who can be found in Susa and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, night and day. I and my female servants will also fast in the same way. After that, I will go to the king, even if it is against the law. If I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went and did everything Esther had ordered him. Notice there again, famous, other famous quote from Esther that doesn't always get equated to Esther, right? If I die, I die. But what's Esther saying? If I die, I'm going to go down swinging. You know, one of the things, you know, Courtney and I have discussed and talked about, and, and it sounds weird, and it's, it's scary sometimes in our society to think about this, but if you come to our house, there are certain sort of key words that our kids know uh, based on if a situation happens. Like if you come in our house and I tell my kids lockdown, they know what that means. They know where they're supposed to go, and they know where they're supposed to hide, and they know what that means. There's something going on that you need to be covered, and you need to be protected, and there's certain things that happen with that. And so when Courtney and I first started talking about this, and, and one of the questions that comes up from people is, well, you know, what if somebody gets your gun? And, and I tell people all the time, well, if they get my gun, they're going to beat me to death with it because they're not getting with anything left in it. Right? In the same way, you look at my wife right there and you think, oh, just nice, sweet, never have any sort of... It, when we went to find her a, a weapon to use in the household, do you know what Mama Bear over there picked out? Right? A 30 round pistol. Okay? If you break in our house and you think I'm the danger, right there. Right? You better hope I get to you before she does. Right? In the same way here, Esther stands in the gap. And says exactly that. If I die, I die. But I'm going to go down swinging. How does one define a mother? Webster defines mother as followed. One, a female parent. Two, a woman in authority. A mother is so much more than the person who helped bring you into this world. A mother is the person who cleans your cuts and wipes your tears. A mother is the person who carries you and your three-foot Snoopy through multiple airports returning from Germany. A mother is the person who skipped dinner to make sure that her children had enough to eat and at one point weighed 90 pounds. A mother is the person who left their dreams behind to make sure you could pursue yours. A mother is the person who left their comfort zone because they knew if they stayed, you'd be in danger. A mother is the person who buys their kid a bullwhip on a trip from Arizona to Texas because it takes a little bit of fear away from the unknown, but also adds a little bit of fear because a seventh grader with a bullwhip is dangerous. A mother is the person who spends the first few weeks in a new apartment sleeping on the floor so that her children has, have a bed to sleep in. A mother is the person who takes a job that others won't because there are bills that must be paid. A mother is the person who, without being asked, loads up to go to the rescue of their kid's friend who had been abused by her own father. 
A mother is the person who pushes you outside of your comfort zone because they know it's what's best for you. A mother is a person who you want to share your successes with. Motherhood is not for the weak. Today, we say thank you to those of you who have chosen to be a mom to someone. With that in mind, let us pray. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the mothers in our life. For those that not only gave birth and chose to be mother, but for those that picked up the mantle either way. God, we thank you for the example of people like Esther who stood in the gap and did what you called them to do, even though it meant staring mortality in the face. God, we thank you that you love us enough that you stood in that gap and offered yourself for us, even though we didn't deserve it. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand with us, church.